that's the deans of another school. Right? <laughs> it's like a guerrilla school, guerrilla marketing. <laughs> so uh, it's been very, very successful. So let me share with you exactly what is our program. How do we do what we do? Okay, we have three um, three avenues, three roads. The first is the environmental road. We recognize that coffee is um, a crop that uses a lot of very dangerous chemicals. In fact, the top 10 chemicals used in coffee are completely forbidden for use in the United States, or they're the most restricted chemicals. So that's a very interesting thing. Many of those chemicals are manufactured in the United States, but we can't use them in the United States because the, our government recognizes that they're too dangerous. But we can manufacture them in the United States and send them to these coffee farmers around the world. And those coffee farmers have great difficulty, this is Indonesia, these coffee farmers have great difficulty in using these chemicals in a safe fashion. First, the United States government says it's impossible to use most of them in a safe fashion. And second, the, 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 the bags of chemicals that come to the farmers usually have uh, writing on them, warnings about the dangerous chemicals, but the writing is in English or Spanish or German. Now, well, that's different. I, I was in Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie. That, that was me in the middle of this. Just to show you that uh, social change and, and social entrepreneurship can also be fun, right? It's not always about sadness and poverty. You can also have a good time. That's Hillary Clinton, me, and one of my uh, great farmers I work with. So I introduced her to Hillary Clinton. She's working in Rwanda on gender violence, one of our projects. I'll talk about it a little bit. So our first, our first road for social change is, is the environment. Um, the majority of people who grow coffee in the world are, as you can see from these photographs, are indigenous peoples. That has a lot of meaning from a sociology point of view, from anthropology point of view, from economics. The first thing to know is indigenous peoples generally do not speak the language of the mainstream. So, when I work in, uh, in Latin America, in South America and Central America, in the many countries I work in, not many of the farmers I work with speak Spanish, even though the national language in every one of those countries, except Brazil, the national language there is Portuguese, right? But all the other countries, the language is Spanish. But when I go into the villages that grow coffee, they don't speak Spanish. They speak quiche, cachiquel, mam, sutuil, uh, ashenincas. These are indigenous languages. And so those farmers, they can't read the pesticide warning. They can't read the chemical usage uh, warnings. So that's where the, the, the anthropology and sociology comes in. So I have to be sensitive as a business person to that situation and, and, and deal with it. So we work with indigenous peoples, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Ethiopia. We work with indigenous peoples all over the world, and we recognize that they are not part of the mainstream culture. And one way that's a problem is in pesticide use. So we work with farmers all over the world uh, to get them not to use chemicals, and to show them that they can create great coffee, high quality coffee, and have a high yield, produce a lot of coffee without the use of chemicals. So we get we help the farmers get involved in the certification of, of organics. So that means not organ a certified organic is not just oh we don't use pesticides. Certified organic is a three year program that the farmers participate in, and they learn uh, proper technical means to save water and to uh, protect the water, to protect the earth from erosion and, and, earth, uh, and loss of earth, and how to use, uh, how to use uh, waste to make compost so that they, they can make their own fertilizer. And after three years, 
then they receive a certification that they are organic. When they get that certification, when they go to the market, the market pays them a premium, a higher price for organic certification. So there's the incentive the farmer has to participate. But since it does cost money to get involved in organic certification, and the farmers are so poor, we usually give the farmers the money for the certification, or we will loan them the money, depending. In some countries, the farmers are better organized and they have more resources. To them, we loan the money. But in a situation like Papua New Guinea, which which a very, very primitive society, we, ha we give them the money. It's a, gra it's a grant. And that's fine. That's part of our mission. So that's the first thing. That's organics to protect the environment. The environment of the farmers and also the health of the consumer. Because the problem with the chemicals is not that they come into your coffee and you drink it and you die. No, that's not it. The problem is that the chemicals go into that coffee in a very small amount, in parts per billion. Very, very small amount. So we don't think there's an impact, health impact. However, over the time of your whole life, if you drink coffee every day, you are taking in those chemicals in parts per billion, but they accumulate, they grow in the body tissue, especially women. It grows in the body tissue. And when you are older, your body starts to use its own tissue. That's why old people have lots of skin hanging off, because your body starts eating itself. And when it does that, the chemicals that go in, in parts per billion, come out into your body in parts per million. That becomes levels of, of danger. So scientists are starting to understand now that the long-term exposure to some of these chemicals is very, very dangerous for older people. So that's important to us, and we recognize that. The second road of our, of our uh, way of dealing with social justice in coffee is economics. We recognize that coffee farmers are at the end of a long supply chain. Most of the farmers in the world only have one, two, three hectares of land, maybe twice the size of this room. So if that's true, they can't sell their product directly to a, a market. They just have too small a production. In the world of coffee, you send the coffee around the world in a container. A container is 300 bags of coffee. A small farmer usually only makes 5 to 10 bags of coffee. So he or she cannot participate directly in international trade. So part of what we do is work with farmers to organize cooperatives so that they can put their, put their uh, coffee together and then they can have a container and send it directly. So by helping the farmers organize into cooperatives, we're allowing them to participate effectively in international commerce. That allows them to get a better price. Why? Because if they're selling only five bags locally to a collector, and he sells it to another collector, and he sells it to a processor, and he sells it to an exporter, and he sells it to an importer in the United States, and the importer sells it to me because I roast the coffee, that's a lot of middlemen. And each one of those middlemen marks the price up. So the farmer gets a very small amount, a very small amount of uh, money for the coffee. I'll give you some figures. In the United States, a, a pound of coffee right now sells for about $12 a pound, let's say, OK? About $12, sometimes $13 a pound. The farmer who doesn't have direct access to trade, the small farmer who must sell to the middlemen, that farmer may only get about 50 cents or 60 cents a pound for that coffee, if they're lucky. Some farmers only get 10 cents or 20 cents. So that's not enough for the farmer to, to live on. That's not much at all. And in the case of people like in Papua New Guinea, sometimes they have no opportunity to get the coffee out and the coffee rots, the coffee becomes destroyed. So they lose a lot of their crop. 
So by working directly with the farmers to help them gain access to the market, we get all of that money back to the farmers, a lot of that money back to the farmers. So I'll give you some examples. This week, I bought coffee from Ethiopia, and I paid four dollars and fifty cents, which is 120, 130 NT, more or less. Okay. So we paid over four dollars U.S. for the coffee to the farmer. That's the money we gave the farmer. Okay, instead of fifty cents that that farmer would have gotten if they just sold it locally, or maybe sixty cents. Um, in Colombia, we paid three dollars and ninety cents a pound for the coffee last week. So this is just an example. In Indonesia, we buy a lot of coffee from Sumatra, and it was about four dollars and sixty cents this week that we're paying directly to the cooperatives, the farmers' cooperatives. So doing business in this fashion brings a lot more money to the co-ops because we get rid of the middlemen. Okay, so. And that means of change, using cooperatives and better price, is, is at the heart of the fair trade system. The fair trade system requires something of the farmer and something of the purchaser. On the farmer's side, fair trade recognizes that the majority of the world's farmers have small land. So fair trade requires the farmers to form cooperatives. Cooperatives generally reflect the social dynamics of indigenous communities. So forming cooperatives is not a hard thing for indigenous farmers to do. It's often very much like their social organization. So it's actually a good thing. So the farmers form cooperatives. That allows them direct access to the market. It allows them information that individual farmers cannot get easily. It allows them to have a head, uh, uh, an office with a computer that individual farmers don't have. So many, many benefits. Other benefits from cooperatives, which are very important, is the requirement that the cooperatives are democratic. That means that every farmer is a member of the cooperative, and they get a vote. And every vote is equal. Now, this may sound, so what? Everybody votes, right? But in most of these societies, it, this may be 